All right. Hey, everyone. This is Bram Kahnstein, and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed, and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you, my fellow millennials, should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Bob Burnett. He has founded several companies in the Bitcoin mining space and is currently the founding CEO of Barefoot Mining, a company that develops Bitcoin mining sites. He holds a degree in computer engineering, has eight patents and over 35 years of experience in the technology industry. He also founded and manages the Barefoot Bitcoin Fund, serves on the board of directors for Ocean Mining and is on the board of advisors for the Satoshi Action Fund. As an evangelist and educator on Bitcoin, he's sure about its importance for the world's future and I'm super excited to talk with him today. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Bram. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to meet. Um, yeah, as I just said off mic, like I've been following you, I think for quite some time, and I love your your insights. And you know, especially as um, you know, this podcast is geared toward millennials. I love your um, I love your views from from the boomer perspective. Your I think your ex your ex handle is Boomer BTC. Uh, yes. And so, as one of the most bullish boomers in Bitcoin, can you share a bit about your personal journey in understanding bitcoin um yeah i also mentioned off mic you know like i i really think that you know uh, boomers and gen xers who are really orange pilled or orange pilled themselves right because you orange pill yourself you know they managed to challenge their personal beliefs like all the things they thought were true and what they learned and um now they see the world in a different way so yeah um, uh, i'm interested yeah. to hear like what, what has been your your journey and how do you do that yeah, so my journey, uh, because I'm old, started a long time ago. I think the 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 genesis of it, the DNA, got laid quite early. Um, so as you mentioned, I have a degree in computer engineering. Um, I graduated in 1986. That's how old I am from college. Um, probably before most of the people listening uh, were born. But I also I also studied economics in school. I have a minor degree in economics, and I was always fascinated by that, just coincidentally, right? And so I started my career in the personal computer industry, designed computers, uh, most notably for a company called Gateway, where I was the chief technical officer. You mentioned that in the bio. We were big. We were about a $10 billion organization at our peak. Um, selling about 10 million PCs annually. And uh, I was part of a team that took them public. And I would say the first really um, material step in my journey started when I started selling my stock options. So I had a lot of stock mm -hmm. options from being you know, part of the company pre-IPO. And I started to come into some wealth for the first time. This would have been in the late 90s. And so I remember taking this pot of money and saying, well, geez, I, I had worked hard for this. I was fortunate. And I said, well, I don't want to lose this money. So, but I was still active in the company, still working hard. So I went to three different financial advisors and I gave them each a third of the money and said, hey, invest this, do what you have to do. Don't lose it though. Like, please don't <laughs> lose this money. And so well, you wanted to protect it, right? I wanted to protect it, right? I mean, a very classic kind of Bitcoin thing, like, hey, this is that that money represented my work, right? Yes. For at that point, almost 15 years, like 15 years of my labor was that money, right? That's yes. what it represented. Yeah. yeah. And those of you, again, again, probably given your age group, that was just before a bubble hit in the market. So there was, I think everybody's familiar with the 2008 bubble collapse, mm -hmm. but in 2001, there was a whole nother one, a whole market collapse, the dot-com bubble burst. And the people who were managing my money didn't do a very good job. And mm -hmm. so after, I can't tell you the exact time, but five to seven years, I start looking at the money I had given them and I was down I was down, not in purchasing, just in purchasing power, but in absolute dollars. So when you factor in inflation, um, it was a disaster, right? So when you when you go negative for five to seven years, 
Um, and that's a lot, right? So if you look at like yeah. your work life and say, hey, I, I you know, I, I have negative production in purchasing power over that extended period, it's hard to recover from that. Yeah. So I became, I started to become very disillusioned by this. And in that early 2000s period, I started looking for other things. And one of the things I found was Austrian economics. So mm -hmm. even though I had a minor degree in it, I'd studied it, it was all Keynesian based. I found out, hey, there's this other school of thought and I aligned with it. It, it made sense to me. It was, um, interestingly, as an engineer, I'm very mathematical and I love things that fit equations, right? So yeah. you're taught in early economics, you're taught a lot of that stuff, right? Um, the Phillips curve or these different things that, that economists pretend you can kind of predict and manipulate the market. And then you find Austrian economics and you go, no, that's, that's to a certain degree hogwash that economies are living, breathing things and you can't control them. You, you, you know, the, the best thing you can do is let them be. And, and if you do, then you won't screw it up. Right. But the yeah. moment you start manipulating it and thinking you, whether it's, interest rates or playing with the money supply or doing those sort of things, you're just bound to screw it up. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to this episode. I just really want to ask you for a quick favor. Over the last few months, I've seen that only 75% of people who listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube are actually subscribed. And the most important thing I'm currently focusing on next to hopefully giving you interesting conversations is growing this podcast subscriber base so I can continue with it into the future. I want to thank everyone who has been viewing and listening to Bitcoin for Millennials, leaving comments here and sending me DMs. It's been super, super motivating. So thank you so much. So I really want to ask you to please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow me on your favorite podcasting app if you are enjoying this podcast. Thanks again for joining me on this journey. Now back to the conversation. Yeah. So well, it's human behavior, essentially. Right. So, yeah. Right. The one side says right. we can model that or we can steer that. And the other says, let's just let it do what it does, basically. Yes. And if you let it do what it does, it will it will moderate. Right. Hmm. It's kind of like nature. Right. You know, it, it, it you know, nature, nature, you know, one summer might be hotter than an, I'm not going to get into the global warming yeah, yeah, conversation, exactly. but, but, <laughs> yeah. but let's just say, you I know, gotcha. generally, you know, we know when summer's coming, we know when winter's coming, there's a cycle, there will be these cycles, but they're not, they're not extreme. You mm -hmm. know, you don't, you don't get summer and winter and winter and summer like you, you kind of, you know, and so the same with an economy that it'll, it'll, it'll moderate, it'll become more predictable. Well, <clears throat> So I start. So in other words, I became this. Another way to state this is I became very disillusioned with Wall Street and the traditional system, and I started looking elsewhere. I was first exposed to Bitcoin in 2011 or 2012, but unfortunately, um, did what a lot of people did um, even to this day. Right? Is I didn't put any material effort into it. It it just seemed too scammy, too uh, unreal, and I discarded it. And I came back. I'll make. I, I won't tell you the 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 long version of the story, but the short version of the story is: in 2017, I got contacted by somebody who said, "Bob, can you develop some Ethereum mining servers for me?" Hmm. Well, that's that's a language I speak, right? So this guy wanted to buy 300 Ethereum mining servers. Um, oh no, sorry. It was, it was 800 Ethereum mining service, several million dollar order. And so I took that order as a computer guy and I designed those computers and started a company that we now know as barefoot mining came from that. And I, I designed those for him. Then after a little bit of time had passed, I started looking at Ethereum technically first, technically and going, I, I don't like it. It doesn't add up. And this would have been 2017, 2018. And so me as a technologist saying, hey, something's not right here. It, it, it's too complex. There's too much going on. There's too many central points of control or uh, by a point of control is the same 
as saying a point of failure. Like there are there are yeah. these things that didn't make sense. So I started looking elsewhere. I went deeper into Bitcoin, found found Bitcoin, you know, and so now the technology started to resonate with me. And then there was this uh, realization that not only was the technology there, but my Austrian principles were embedded within the whole thing. And yeah. so that's when it really, so I could say kind of 2018 is really when everything came together. We kind of left all the Ethereum shit behind. So, sorry, if, I don't know if you want to swearing on this. Um, I think it's but, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm Dutch, all the I'm Ethereum all shit, <laughs> I, left it, yeah. I left it behind. And, yeah. um, you know, we, we repositioned the company um, into uh, the, the Bitcoin space. So, yeah. uh, but, and, and I will say that, I mean, it's a journey, right? I mean, even, even as a person with a technical background and an economics background, I'm sitting here six, seven years later, still peeling back the onion a little bit, still yeah, finding beauty and depth that is truly amazing. Uh, yeah. A few things I, I think I want to touch upon in this story. I, I, I also find it fascinating that what you mentioned had the 15 years of life work that were basically captured, you know, in an X amount of money yep. that you then try to protect. You know, that's, that's why I said protect means yep. not go lower. Right. Right. And if there's an, you know, keep, keep the, keep the value or the energy that's in there. Uh, not make it go lower, perhaps make it go up, but at least protect it, you know, at, at, at that level. Right? Yes, at a minimum. This is, this is generally like a, a, a tactic I'm using when I talk to people, right? Like a spe specifically this, like you had your physical or your mind power, you know, you expended that, you got rewarded in return. And your goal is to, if you don't want to spend that energy that's packaged in the money right now, you want to spend it in the future, whenever whatever that yeah. is, right? So consciously or unconsciously, that is your goal eventually. Correct. Mm -hmm. Because you want to use this energy to, you know, buy or uh, create something that costs energy to, to create or, or, or maintain. So you, you, you had that feeling, you, you found other people to help you do that. But were there things that you, even though you were in tech, this company went IPO, you had an economics background. Were you aware of of that you were doing this, like like the 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 let's say yeah, conserving the energy part of it? Like, were you aware of it, or were you just following what you what you thought was the way to go? Uh, uh oh, I would say at a superficial level, yes, but not not at the deep well, level that I have now. Right. Exactly. So at a, yeah. but, but, but I will say, like I said, at a superficial level, I mean, I, I was very aware that I had just worked for roughly a decade and a half in an in industry that took a lot out of me. There was, you know, um, the personal computer industry of that era is very much like Bitcoin was. Like this was the, you know, I was, um, I don't want to back, get too dwelling on it, but like my... My first project in 1986 was to be part of the design team of what I consider to be the world's first laptop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, were, we were doing things that had that same excitement and world-changing implications that I believe Bitcoin has. You know, I, I, there's been a couple of those, like in, in modern times, the personal computer, the internet, um, cell phones. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, Bitcoin. I think there's there's only a handful that are in that stratosphere where you go. Well, every aspect of society is it personally, business, government, social structures, like all these things, um, radically changed. Right, every industry yeah. is changed by them, and yeah. so, um, uh, so I was aware that I had been part of that and I, and I got a nice financial reward for it. I was aware that I might never get that again, that, mm -hmm. that, that level of, cause I, I earned a nice salary, but the stock option part and having those go nuts, like that can't count on that happening you know, ever. That's a sheer luck. And that's why I, when I, the, my instructions to those guys were like, protect this, please yeah. protect this. Yeah. And by the way, I don't believe any of them were crooks. 
I don't be, it's just that the reality was that they really didn't have the tools or the ability to do what I asked them to do and to a certain degree what they promised they could do like yeah. there was a certain air of confidence about it by the way an air of confidence I see today that worries me for people like again you know looking at your audience like a lot of people will say things like well uh I see a lot of people pour their wealth into real estate, as an example. And under this guise that it's an asset that has almost no downside to it. And they they view real estate as scarce and they view it as a cash flowing asset. And there's all these passive income strategies and things like that that are centered around it. Um, and they are a result, all those things and all that real estate is a result of the existing system. Right? Yeah. The, way, the way money works and the desire of the world to store value in that asset. That's really why that happens. And so if either that system starts to fail or a better store of value becomes more apparent to people than real estate can lose. So it, you know, I, I, I'm afraid for people that like get very leveraged like into real estate and think they have made it because they can have the whole system collapse on them too. Yeah. Well, it's also, I think just based on a certain understanding or expectation or what they think they should do, perhaps similar as to what you did, you know, in, in, you know, early 2000 or 2001, I, I think in general, you move with what you know. Um, but that's also why I find it so fascinating that people who are into Bitcoin and came from a more traditional world, you know, actually now don't see those traditional assets as something they, they actually should invest in, you know, or they have control over. So, yeah, yeah, I think you just have to learn the hard, the hard way. I think it's very hard to... I do, I do think I went a bit through this journey, right? To like orange pill yourself without a problem, in a sense, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. or, or losing a lot of money in you know other other assets. But in general, like you you have to experience some sort of downside somewhere to actually question, you know, what am I actually doing? Do I understand what I'm? Uh, yeah, what I'm doing. Yeah, and that's you know I think that for boomers. The issue is that you know, many of them have gotten to the point where they're almost completely insulated at this point. Mm. So let's say they've they've acquired massive amounts of wealth, and it's some in real estate, and some in equities, and some in bonds, and some in cash, and some in these sort of things. And they, at a minimum, they feel invincible, like they've. They've maybe retired. They think they have it all figured out. And maybe they do. Maybe they don't have that much life left. And so they really don't have to worry. Like the, the most catastrophic situation you could think of. Yeah. And that's a problem. When I do, I do a lot of public speaking. And often when I'm speaking with that kind of group, one of the first things I'll say is you need... To understand what I'm going to tell you, you need to take yourself out of this position in a first world country with a first world financial system. You need to ignore all the successes you've had and your friends and family have had in life. And you go place yourself in Argentina or Lebanon or, by the way, a part of my perspective comes from my wife who was born and raised in the Philippines. That mm -hmm. helped me a lot to understand Bitcoin. Um, because, you know, when you look at it through those optics, it's a lot easier. Those people get it much, much more quickly. Yeah. And so th those, but it's a small percentage at this point. It's a small percentage that can suspend and truly remove themselves from their position and then go take that other perspective. It's, it's yeah. hard. So what, how was this? 
how, how did you then handle like the, the the Austrian point of view shift? Basically, you learned about Austrian economics. You are educated or programmed in a certain way. Um, how, how did you handle that? Did it just make more rational sense, and did it just like win or something? But or, or like how how did you how did you challenge yourself in that? Well, I think the things that resonated with me um, were you know, rules, not rulers. So the, yeah. the removal of money from the state was a big thing. And you'll see in a lot of Austrian thought and libertarian thought that's kind of analogous to it. You know, you see that kind of a certain distrust of the state. Distrust, by the way, not 100% meaning people doing bad things, but it, it involves incompetence and improper incentives too. Like, the, the, like there's all those things that say it's the, the state managing money is a bad place. Like it, it's the wrong place and, yeah. and essentially any, any human managing money. And then you add in things like sound money principles, which are a key piece of typically of Austrian thought that, you know, a lot of gold bugs, obviously, you know, and still that way, like even the Austrian community hasn't embraced Bitcoin wholeheartedly, the gold community and the precious metals community still is largely resistant to it. Um, we talked a little about Larry Lepard before, who's a friend of mine, you know, and Larry's, Larry's one of the guys of my generation and also guys <laughs> that came from like that world yeah. that embraces Bitcoin and sees it. But, uh, you know, we can talk about the psychology of this in a little, little bit maybe, but, uh, you know, the, 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 those things resonated with me, the fixed money supply. And I still think a lot about this today, the importance of absolute scarcity and the implications of absolute scarcity, which the Austrian thought would embrace, but that nobody has actually, like there's very little written mm -hmm. about absolute scarcity because it's never existed. Well, like then we that, have provable actual, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, scary. auditable, verifiable. Yeah, exactly. Like, like these are these are wild concepts. But I think what happens too is, like I said, even within the Austrian community, even within the precious metals community, and they're, they they somewhat overlap. Um, when you talk to gold bugs, they're often people. Say, I'm I'm almost sixty. Okay. I was born in 1964. If, if you take somebody who's my age, and let's say in the mid-80s or early 90s, they started buying gold. And they saw the problems with the system. They had this distrust of state and money. And they start buying gold. They start buying silver. They're buying all kinds of coins. And I have, there's a, there's a, a, a silver, silver one right here, right? So you get people uh, stacking this stuff, right? And and they've they've been evangelizing to their family and friends, and probably ridiculed for saying buy this buy this stuff. Well, it's almost like thirty years later, like the vision hasn't fulfilled. But now the economic and political conditions start to align and they feel like ah, finally gold and silver's time has come. And out of left field, Andreas Antonopoulos, I'm stealing this from him, this punk rock thing comes in, <laughs> Great Bitcoin, yeah. and it completely blows up and supersedes this whole thing. So, you know, you either embrace punk rock or at which point you have to essentially say i've i think the feeling would be i've just wasted 30 years like i have 30 years of my life not only financially invested in this other thing but emotionally invested in this other mm -hmm. thing and the, that's the harder part i think by the way i think that's the harder part is to to look in the mirror to look at these other people and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Don't buy gold. Don't buy silver. Bitcoin's better. 
Yeah. Like what a sunk cost fantasy, right? Yes. Yeah. It, it's, that's a tough one. Yeah. That's a hard one. The, I, I think that's a real psychological uh, thing where the just going along with whatever you started feels better than admitting that you were wrong and that, you know, you should take another, another path, right? Like that's a real deal. Yep. And it does yep. make sense. But do you also think then, because these people did that a while ago, I think like, I'm obviously thinking about someone like Peter Schiff, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the interesting child. part there is, I think the, you can feel like that, you know, what you just said, like, wow, I'm kind of like in this catch 22, <laughs> like, should I do this or should I do that? Like both, it's basically a defeat in a sense. Um, but he's on the offense, like, and that I find fascinating that, that when you then look at Bitcoin, that the whole thing about, you know, stay humble, um, show your humility, right? You, uh, you know that you don't know everything, like all these more ethos type things in Bitcoin. I find it interesting that, and I wonder what you think about it, like where does that come from in Bitcoin and why isn't that in any other type of asset, basically, like you have gold box and you have real estate, you know, uh, yeah. um, enthusiasts, etc. like people are all into that. But why is Bitcoin so Beatles driven as well? Like, where does it come from? Yeah, well, I think it's because Bitcoin isn't just an asset. And, you know, it, it, it is, it's an entire ecosystem in and yeah. of itself. You could almost argue that like you and I don't know each other well. However, um, from the little I know of you, which would be some Twitter interactions in this call mm -hmm. today, I would say that you and I are aligned like countrymen, mm -hmm. that, that I have that feeling about Bitcoiners that would rival my patriotic spirit and, and, you know, it's it's because we have a mission to we see a path to a way of life, not only for ourselves but for our children and our grandchildren and those sort of things. I, I, gold gold doesn't provide that. You know, mm. gold no stock does, no gold does. You know, they they're they're like transactional things. They're not relationship things. Yeah. And so, you know, Bitcoin, and by the way, that's another problem into why does boomers or, uh, I'll just talk boomers for the moment, why do boomers struggle? Because it's very difficult for them to understand that Bitcoin is not just an asset. In fact, its, it's qualities as an asset are a small piece of what it is. It is yeah, and in debt, it is already an, superior. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Uh, great questions. You know, I think those are great philosophical ponderings. Um, but they're they're key pieces of Bitcoin's resilience because, much like a country, like you know, well, okay, we we've lost. Bitcoin has lost some battles and suffered some blows. It's had traders like um Craig Wright or Sam Bankman yeah. Freed. It's had these bad actors that cause damage, but like, you know, we're 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 countrymen, we're patriotic about this. And so we're <clears throat> we're still gonna march forward. You know, we're disappointed that those things happen, but we're still marching forward. You know? yeah. And and yeah. I, 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 I have the exact same feeling. Like I had never met a Bitcoiner I didn't like because there is this, this shared understanding of not only that I know that you did the work, you know, what we just talked about, like you did the work to, to, to understand this and it's really hard, but also, yeah, where we see it going, that's kind of what bonds us. And then like the location or religion or gender or age or profession, like all these things are super irrelevant. Um, and I think that also makes life simpler in a certain, in a certain way, right? Where people, you know, let's stay with the fiat system, people in the fiat system, they argue over everything, all these little differences and all these little stu stupid things. And I think in Bitcoin, 
there's not really any of that. Like, um, yes, of course, there's debates about all the tech stuff, you know, but just on, like on a personal level, it doesn't really matter what you're into when you're into Bitcoin, you know, um, we probably can get along. And that's not because of the subject, but because the underlying, um, I'd say yeah. more, more the work that we both did. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I said something, I, I did an interview with uh, Peter McCormick a while ago. And one of the things I said on that show uh, was that I've gone through this development in my own life from starting with looking at Bitcoin maybe as a technology or asset to a realization that no, it it has become in many ways, the second most important thing in my life, my, my family and my close friends are more important to me, right? Their, their welfare and their happiness is the most important thing to me. But after that, I've come to realize that what happens with Bitcoin, and I'm not talking about the price, I'm talking about the adoption, and it's, it's you know, getting the world to embrace it is really the second most important thing because I, I believe almost all other ills on this earth are at least in a, a, a secondary way, if not a primary way, the result of the broken monetary system and manipulation by the state and sort of things. And so um, living the ethos, which you, you mentioned before, you know, I try to do that personally, try to run my company, and all my investments from that same perspective, you know, do do no harm to Bitcoin. Do what's best for Bitcoin. If if something benefits me personally, but harms Bitcoin, do I want to be involved in it? Um, and I think each of us, like to to evaluate where you are in your Bitcoin discovery, you know. If, if somebody said, <clears throat> hey, I'm going to write you a check, I will call it for an obscene level of wealth, but it means that Bitcoin is going to either have a major setback or fail, you know, what, what would you do? And, and if, if the answer is, I'll take the money, okay, you know, um, but I, I'd say really ask that question like, and, and really present it because some of you out there may actually get that opportunity at some point. Like I, I, um, I've talked about this before. In the last cycle, I just kind of got an into Bitcoin, but we started this bull run, right? And we were involved in Bitcoin mining and we had the opportunity to go public. We had companies, like there are companies that, their business is taking companies public. So, you know, they'll, they'll knock on your door if you reach a certain level of, and it doesn't take a lot, right? They'll start knocking on your door and any, any modicum of su success and you'll probably start getting that. And we said, no, we won't do it because we, I believe that, especially for a mining company, a Bitcoin mining company, that what will happen is if you go public, you change your time horizon, you change your time preference. It will force you, no matter what you think, it will force you into high time, for, high time preference behaviors. Yeah. And you will start making decisions based upon what makes your next quarter's results better. You'll, you'll, you'll choose that over maybe what's best for your company and for Bitcoin in the long run. Um, and it's just a, it's a result of Wall Street. And I lived it. I, I, you know, I can say that as somebody, you know, said we became a massive company. And I saw even in the personal computer industry that maybe it wasn't the best idea for, for my company to have gone public. It generated a lot of wealth for me. And in hindsight, I go, huh? maybe I would have actually made more money. Maybe I would have stayed in that career longer. Maybe, maybe um, we had 25,000 employees and that company eventually was acquired by Acer and Nobody works for Gateway anymore. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what did you better. achieve then? Yeah. Right. Right. Like what? Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. this was a question I wanted to ask later, 
I wanted to ask, like, do you see Bitcoin as just a technology or also a philosophy? But I think we already answered that in this way, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's more than just um, the tech. Um, yeah, and I feel the same. Like that is what fascinates me so much. Like sometimes even in this podcast, for me, like I hear myself say things of which maybe three years ago, I thought I would never say them, yeah. right? But it's the, it, it, I really think that Bitcoin change, changes you once you yeah. are hooked in some way, whatever dimension it is, you get in on it. But every day, I learned, yesterday I tweeted something, I learned something new after 10 years, I'm still learning something new almost every day yes. about yeah. this thing. Know, and that is just uh, very rewarding, just intellectually. On, only that, yeah. it, it's it's already rewarding. Yeah, I um, you know, I'll almost go back to what I said before about Bitcoin being almost like a country. And so I think uh, my my wife is a naturalized U.S. citizen. She became a U.S. citizen six or seven years ago, and I went to the ceremony where she took the the, the oath and became a citizen. Mm -hmm. And I think that. I think Bitcoin is much like that. It's more an oath to yourself, but like yes. I, I would view myself as I'm a citizen of Bitcoin. Mm. And I, you know, because I believe in what it stands for and I will protect it. Right. So when you, when you look at, when you look at at least the U S citizenship oath, I'm, I'm sure other countries around the world have a similar oath when you become a naturalized citizen, right? Yeah. That you take an oath to to it, and it usually says, "Hey, I'll abide by the laws. I believe in what it stands for, and I am willing to fight and die to protect these things." Yeah. And I think that's kind of where we are with a lot of us with Bitcoin. I mean, you make your own personal decision, but but that's why. That's why we have this vigilance uh, about it is that, that you cross a threshold. I wasn't there in 2017 and 2018. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you exactly what day that threshold was crossed. It was probably somewhere in that 18, 19 period. But now my, my vigilance and loyalty is much, much stronger, you know, those who don't understand us probably look at it as fanatical. Well, um, I wanted to ask and, Bob, are we in a cult? <laughs> That's uh, what some people say, right? Like, yeah, it's a cult. It's a cult. Um, I don't personally don't really mind. I, you know, I guess call it what you will. Like I said, <laughs> yeah. I, um, I never said this before. This is the first time I've ever said it. I, I believe I am. I am we do this today. I, I've never heard anybody else say it. I believe I am a citizen of Bitcoin, and and um, like that that you know that kind of from this conversation kind of has uh, brought that that expression to me to try to describe how I feel about it. So no, I'm, I'm it's not a cult. Um, call it what you will, you know. Uh, but but I I I'm well, a citizen. If you say citizen, then. We're a digital civilization in a sense. I, I have to think of what Balaji says go. about the network state, right? In, in a sense, yes. um, that is what, what Bitcoin is. That's also why people are everywhere and it doesn't really matter again, like where you're from or, who, you know, what you like or, or all these things. We are connected yeah. in the digital realm and in the, yeah. in the, in the 3D realm, you are you and yeah. I me, but we are different in the digital realm. That's where we yeah. were connected. Yeah. Love that. You cool. know, it might be the first time that, that I think the concept of, like you use the word cult. Okay. Mm. And I think that if we look at how people have, have come together in aligned groups before, it's typically either been because of country, which is primarily kind of some geographic and cultural assimilation mm. or religious. Sometimes those are the same thing, right? Because the state is well, they went is to the countries to uh, spread the religion. Also. Yeah. So this, I, I'm not a historian at that level, um, but it seems to me maybe this is the first time this we've reached this level 
of of community of of where there there is the, an ethos that that's strong that wasn't driven either by the state or by by religion. This is coming from a different yeah, place. I agree. It's probably something along the lines of the alignment of the incentives, right? Like I I like to say that. Uh, I also say all the other stuff, but also in gold, you know, the whole zero sum game of a lot of industries and a lot of assets is not what applies to Bitcoin, right? In Bitcoin, it's a mutually beneficial game. And once you understand that, then we can also be citizens together and help each other, right? Like if I do something for Bitcoin, it benefits you and the other way around. Like I benefit from your work. How cool is that? You know, like yeah, you, yeah. you help me without actually knowing me, you know, and that I think is what attracts people once they understand that it's a mutually beneficial game. And so the rules instead of rulers, right, you can only uh, profit, right, or get value from this system when you abide by the rules. And when you abide by the rules, you know that the others in the system also abide by the rules. And that's, I think, what creates the connection, right? There's no one who is above these rules because there are no um, ruler. So the only thing we agreed upon is we follow the same set of rules yeah. and, and that's it. And that is probably pretty unique where there's no, where it's all voluntary yeah. also, right? It's not forced or, you know, by any state yeah. or any entity or yeah. whatever. And so it's our own decision to follow the rules that binds yeah. us. I think I'm just thinking out loud yeah. as well, uh, but I like, I like this angle. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Nice. Well, I know uh, not my area of expertise, but you know we, we all dabble, right? And I, um, Jordan Peterson, I'm familiar with him and his work. But you know, mm -hmm. one of the things he'll say um, is in child psychology, he'll, he'll quote a, a guy named Piaget, and he'll say that essentially, if if a group of kids are playing together, and one of the, they're playing a game. And one of the children continually violates the rules, or even worse, keeps trying to change the rules. Then eventually, the other kids say, "I don't want to play with you anymore. You're not my yeah. friend." Yeah. However, the opposite is also true. If you and I are playing together, and we abide by a set of rules that are fair, you know that's where you know fun fun and friendship result from that and trust comes from that and so you know what bitcoin does is is it takes out the human propensity to try to want to do those things and forces us to live by the rules right and yeah. and then well, to control I think the base after, layer of our agreement basically Right. Right. Yeah. That, I think that's it. So we have an agreement. That's the base layer of our interaction. And it's so beneficial for both of us that we do not fuck with it. Yes. And, and, and in the other system, there is a way to fuck with it because yeah. there is there is not one understanding of the base layer. So there are all these opportunities to um, corrupt it. And then it's just human nature, right? Like anything that yeah. is can possibly be corrupted will be corrupted yeah. or just personal yeah. personal gain yeah nice yeah man i have i have a lot of questions left but i love i love this yeah. uh, this this angle okay, is great go. like in, in general man like i started this podcast i think it's so cool like just to also reflect with other people like on this bitcoin journey right because yep. well you have larry who lives three miles away from you so you can discuss with him right but i think for a lot of people in bitcoin you know the 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 the, the real life or 3D life uh, Bitcoin's, um, you know, circle for a lot of people is pretty small. So you have like all these yeah. digital uh, contacts, uh, right? But once you, right. like sometimes you end up at a place when you think about Bitcoin, you know, like, oh, could it be this big or is it really like this, you know? And then it's easy to have your ego kick in and be like, nah, you know, that's too big. You're not smart enough or whatever. Like you need to reflect with other people who end up at the same place, you know, whatever their background is or again, age or religion or whatever, you know. And so right. I think that's it's a nice way to strengthen your understanding of 
but what we both think this uh, this could be right and uh i, I think it's fu it's fun that these thoughts flow so naturally i think it shows that that if it goes so naturally that you actually understand you know it's kind of like proof for yourself that um that you understand what you studied and really also kind of like integrated it in in your thinking so yeah i really like that yeah um i wanted to ask you a question i uh, as i mentioned like you are on the board of the satoshi uh, board of advisors of the satoshi action fund which is a nonprofit led by dennis porter who's on a mission to provide right. bitcoin friendly legislation in the states uh, there's a lot of stuff going on with the states in america right especially with texas like, what is your view on legislation around Bitcoin and like the tension that exists between the states and the federal government, uh, right? Like the federal government needs yeah. to, you know, they have to keep printing the money to stay afloat. But in essence, there are some states that, you know, could be independent or are just, you know, they have enough power, et cetera. Like how, how do you view this? And again, by the way, with Bitcoin as a differentiator, that's where the, Satoshi Action Fund, I think, comes in. They can position themselves against like other states and and also attract people that find this technology uh, of Bitcoin important. So yeah, that, that yeah. was a lot of text. But what are your thoughts there? Yeah, it's a it's a very uh, good question. So I'm a miner, so we'll start from maybe that perspective or answer it from that perspective. So. First thing I'll say is, as we're expanding, we're looking for new places. We have, as our first criteria, what I call jurisdictional acceptance. Okay. So we're yeah. looking at that location, and if it's U.S.-based, but this is true in any country, right? How, I guess, if we're going to enter a new country, is the mm -hmm. country open to it? Right. So like as an example, most of Europe, as much as I would like to, I can't really consider it right now. There's just too much turmoil there um, versus like Central America and Africa. The jurisdictional acceptance is good. Now, the risk can be high. Right. But um, but that's a that's a secondary issue. So are they are they open to us at the nation level? at the state level and at the local level. So you have to ask all those questions. Now in the US, what typically happens is, at least for the moment, we don't have a federal issue, although I think the next election is very important. At the state level, I essentially now believe that there are well, probably approaching half of the states that are not on our list, right? Uh, as an example, the entire West Coast of the United States off the list. It doesn't matter how cheap the energy is. It doesn't matter how attractive the deal might be because the risk of being shut down is just too high, right? So the, the, the nightmare scenario is, hey, you go put, let's say, several million dollars into bringing a site up and 90 days later, they're cutting the power to your site or they're hitting you with fines and injunctions. It's just too high. Secondarily, at the local level, there are often things like noise ordinances. Those are usually employed at the local level. So, you know, are, do you have to worry about those things? Now, we would always want to go into a place where we were a good citizen, um, a, a good uh, custodian, um, and a positive thing to the community. So we wouldn't want to go in there and create a noise problem. Um, uh, but then the third thing is, even outside of the government, do the people there, are they largely going to be welcoming or hostile? Because you don't want to have to go hire employees for a company when the majority of the people in the community are going to detest the company. Um, that's just not a healthy thing, right? You don't want to you don't want to be in a position where somebody says, "Oh, I I work for Company X," and everybody in the community um, scowls because, like, "Oh, you work there." Like, like, you want people to be proud of where they work. So, 
So what that does in large part is in the middle of the U.S., say from, you know, like the North Dakota and the Canadian border kind of on down to Texas, that that swath is largely uh, amiable to mining. Most of the southeast of the U.S. is amiable to mining. So those are the main places um, that we would look. Yeah. Now, what's happening, we'll speak, you know, obviously specific to the U.S., is just last week, the Biden administration used Emergency Act powers, which I find absolutely ludicrous, to put a survey in place where they say they're coming out to every mining company in the country and essentially forcing them under penalty of large fines and potentially even jail time to answer questions about their energy consumption, what equipment they have connected, um, like those sort of questions. Yeah. Uh, that's really concerning. Um, I have no intention of responding to that survey. I haven't been asked yet, at, at least as of February 6th, um, mm -hmm. uh, 3, 30 p.m. Eastern, I haven't been asked yet. But assuming it's coming, I have no intention of asking. I will fight it. Um, to the very end, um, I would, to the point of, like, I have a serious cons talk with my wife if it comes to that, like, do I need to go to jail for this? Because I view it as such a massive intrusion of privacy and freedom that goes way beyond Bitcoin. And, and yeah. I hope the rest of the country and the world understands what this means. because. It's the Biden administration, but it could be anybody, right? It, it could be any, any, um, any group in power trying to make moral judgments about two things. One is the use of energy. And two is what software you use your computing power for. Yeah. So... So and those are so both of those things are at stake, and and if we are forced, obviously at the first stage to just disclose even what we're doing, that's a massive invasion of privacy. At the point, like see, because he already tried last spring, the Biden administration tried last spring to impose a tax on energy consumption of Bitcoin mining companies or yeah. Bitcoin miners in general. So. Should something like that come about, what essentially it, it is just one step away from saying, okay, somebody can make moral judgments. Are microwave ovens or hot tubs or curling irons, I mean, you pick whatever it is that consumes energy from somebody being in a position of power making a moral judgment about that. Mm -hmm. But it also is essentially the equivalent of like I happen to have a MacBook Pro that we're doing this interview on, right? And so in the background, I have Microsoft Outlook, I have Excel, I have PowerPoint. I could be mining Bitcoin. There's nothing preventing me from mining Bitcoin on that computer. Yeah. So um, them saying that they're going to tax the cons you know, well. well the earlier last spring's proposal, them saying they're going to tax that means that they would have to have monitoring software on my computer to know when I'm running that software versus when I'm running Excel. And obviously that's a massive, massive intrusion. So yeah. um, what I would hope is, but I, I find it very unlikely that even individuals and organizations that are vehemently opposed to Bitcoin would oppose this survey and oppose any legislation or taxation along these lines because all it takes is a change in the the administration and the complexion of the House and the Senate then for that to turn and be directed at somebody else and their business yeah. or their personal activities. Yeah, I think that's a great example of how if you just don't apply to Bitcoin, then 
probably could be applied to anything else but like it's also even it's very unmanageable it currently it really sounds like it's more like a threat to see who who bites and then you know they can create some precedent or something but how how is this uh, how how could states battle this you know if we go back to satoshi action fund like oh, right. this is of course Sorry. a federal a federal thing how is there tension be, you know with let's say this issue and how the states view it because if i follow what um what they're doing in the states there's a lot of uh new yeah. legislation either just passed or coming up yeah. uh, with regards to bitcoin yeah, well, I think we've had several states. Um, Dennis, I believe, is in Missouri again right now because we're talking about yeah. the Social Action Fund, working with the state of Missouri. Um, there are several states that either have legislation or pending legislation starting to try to protect these sort of things. Now, I think this is what you were getting at before, and, and I believe there is the potential for a massive conflict between states and the federal government about states' rights. And, you know, we're starting to see these individual states, um, you know, put up these defenses and try to protect the citizens of those states uh, on yeah. the privacy perspective, especially. Uh, the privacy and the, the, the freedom perspective, both of those angles. And um, it could get very interesting. I mean, you know, we probably beyond the scope of what we should talk about here, at least in any depth. But I mean, we see, we see the same thing happening with the protection of the border. Like where, yeah. where can the state, you know, set it up? And, and this is almost like the same sort of thing, but in the virtual world, right? In the digital yeah, exactly. world, it's like, yeah. who's going to protect the border? Like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so. Well, every you know, state should you know, instead of, well, you know, with the border issue, it's like you have to open the border. They they say to this, you know, the federal government asks or, well, um, forces the states. Um, but in Bitcoin's case, it would be like you should close the border, right? Like you should not uh, accept any miners or any other, you know, infrastructure related businesses to um, contribute to the Bitcoin network. So they're basically yeah. asking to 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 block those types of uh, of companies yeah it's interesting to to see that continue i i i find it fascinating to see just the tension just in general you know the system in america is, is very different from um from the rest of the world with regards to the power of the state so yeah that'll be an interesting yeah. uh, interesting topics to follow like yeah yeah like one of the things where this came from or at least what is in uh, you know what they use as arguments uh, from like the federal point of view. You know they talk about the energy use, they talk about the environmental concerns. Like what what are your thoughts there? Like do you have any general explanation of you know what legitimizes or explains you know the energy use and like what what are your responses to like the environmental concerns with regards to mining, etc. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm probably a little different than most in this because I I I would say first and foremost um, I'll go back to what I said before that my use and by that I mean me personally and my business what I use energy for is of nobody else's concern and you know if it is ever decreed that somebody else can change either my access to energy or my price of energy because of what i do we have lost at a mm -hmm. massive level i mean it it is equivalent to losing freedom of speech i mean it, it is on that level like we have lost the essence of freedom in this country so that's the first thing um the second thing is that if you want to argue about what we are doing, um, which I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. But even if I did, I would say, well, we are fixing what we perceive to be. And I'll go back to citizens of Bitcoin. The citizens of Bitcoin believe this is the biggest threat to 
humanity, at least to, to humanity thriving. And I think most Bitcoiners would say a broken monetary system is worse than the climate issues or any of those other, you know, basically put anything else up there. And a broken monetary system is, um, is the number one thing. So what we are doing, I think we can justify almost any level of energy usage if we must on an ethical basis because we're fighting the world's biggest problem. Now, yeah. the, the next thing is that it just so happens that Bitcoin incensed those are, who are concerned about climate change. It has incented, and the data will prove it out, that it has incented the development of relatively green um, energy. And it is the, en it, the industry using the greatest amount of green energy in the entire, you know, in the entire world. Now, um, one other thing I want to say, though, is that it's my belief that a mistake Bitcoiners make is they respond to the climate change narrative or the energy use narrative with energy first. So I think largely the community will say, oh, no, it's not true. You know, your, your assertion that Bitcoin uh, is damaging isn't true. Look how green we are. Look mm -hmm. at the things we do with demand response. It's my opinion that's largely the wrong way to respond because um, I think we should lead with asserting why we are Bitcoiners. We believe that what we are doing is fixing the world's biggest problem, which is a broken monetary system. A secondary effect of that happens to be these other things. So I, I believe the lead is often wrong because yeah. um, we, we, we are not Bitcoiners because we are fixing the grid. We are not mm -hmm. Bitcoiners because we are trying to fight climate change. Like, like, you know, so I think it's dangerous. It's dangerous because I think largely the community responds to the criticism by speaking their language instead of our language. It's a defensive approach as opposed to an offensive yeah. approach. Well, if you step into that frame, it's, I do agree it's kind of a trap. On the other side, you know, if you say like, how, uh, you know, if someone says something about the environmental impact or the energy use, then if your reply is something along the lines of, you know, where your argument <laughs> opinion is coming from is totally wrong, <laughs> wrong. You know, you should search it in the corner of a broken money system. I, I, like, I, I agree that that rationally is where it comes from, but you will probably also lose a lot of people. But I also agree that if you step inside of the trap of having this conversation, you know, replying, as you said, uh, you know, it's 55% uh, sustainable energy. Uh, what are you talking about? You know, then, then you are actually having that conversation that you perhaps don't want to have um i was yeah. thinking of of a tweet i retweeted yesterday which maybe could strengthen your uh, approach to you know we are building a new money system and a secondary consequence of that is that that it uses a lot of energy i saw a tweet um yeah. i'll share it with you in dm but um from a guy uh, drew bansal and he shared the Nakamoto ratio, and that's the fraction of the world's electricity used in proof of work to secure the money supply. And mm -hmm. I love that because then, you know, it's a brilliant metric to to track Bitcoin's adoption because if you say, well, if energy is the um, most important asset in the world, um, then the more energy that's directed to securing the base layer of this new money system, the more it legitimizes the money system. And that's just it, right? So you could also yeah. say, well, the fact that uh, this much energy is directed towards um, securing this money system should actually be a signal for you um, that demonstrates the importance of this money 
system you know and if this interests you i can tell you more about it you know so something along those yeah. those lines i yeah i i think those are good things um you know part of the problem i think we have is that the general public like one of the first things a, a bitcoiner learns like when you become a bitcoiner is is you have to learn what money is right you know because you you realize that your concept of it yeah you know what it is and how it works has been grossly distorted so we have this problem when the criticism comes we're talking to a group of people who haven't done the work yet right because yeah. you know what you said it okay money is the most valuable asset right well it's ha i mean to be clear money is half Energy. of everything well well money is half yeah. of everything right mm -hmm. one and two what is money but energy? So yes. what is inflation? Inflation is a loss of energy. So when inflation is 4% or 10% or whatever number you want to believe on a global basis, probably on a global basis, it's probably more like 12 or 14. You add up all the inflation around the world. Well, that's the annual energy loss, right? Because if, mm -hmm. if, if if money is energy or and and or work right then when inflation is 14% well we just lost 14% of the energy compounded annually yeah um <laughs> and so why don't we fix that problem that that is you know the solution but to your point and you know the people out there on the front lines and i I'm, I'm semi on the front lines but you know people like dennis it's hard. Like I appreciate what he has to do because he's going to go sit down with might be a state senator or a congressperson or a member of their yeah. staff, and he gets twenty minutes to try to pitch something. You know, I, it, yeah. getting them to sit down and it's 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 terrible. Like these, you know, the the I don't. Know, as you get older, one of the things you realize is that. People that you may have held, like when, when I was younger, people I held in high esteem, congressmen, senators, yeah. um, CEO and executives of big financial companies, you know, I, you know, I thought, well, the, as a young person, I would think well, these must be really accomplished, really intelligent people, really knowledgeable, well-learned people. And then you start to meet them and you start either the directly or and you see the results of their actions and you realize not, not not really they're really not and and they're also um they're they they have very high time preferences there is a lot of greed a lot of power grabs um the shine the shine and the luster uh just mm. goes all the way in fact it it ends up I think for a lot of people like me, you end up 180 degrees opposed to it. And you yeah. go, well, I don't want to accuse every single person in those positions of being corrupt um, and ignorant. And um, uh, what would you say? I can't think of other bad well, words. But uh, No, but you know, I think the spirit gets corrupted because you participate in a certain system, right? So you cannot blame... Yeah. I don't think, I also don't think like all the people, all, all those people act in a malicious way, but it's they conform yeah. to a system in which they act. And then, yeah, yeah, I just, I just said spirit, your spirit gets corrupted. Uh, and you start playing that game. You start playing a game that you probably also don't understand. Right. And yeah. then that's also one of the things that attracts me to Bitcoin, the, the like do the work, proof of work, walk the talk. Right. Yeah. Like it's. Yeah. If if there's no one in politics that actually adopts that, and it's not because of those specific individuals, it's just they are playing another game, right? And and yeah. it, it, in that game, it works if you just talk and you don't have to do the walk, and you still get legitimized. Th that's great, <laughs> you know. But yeah, I f I think Bitcoiners would then argue like, okay, but you say this, can you show me that? And there's no yeah. like the your bullshit detector is just uh yeah. gone up uh with accuracy when you are into Bitcoin, I think. 
and yeah. you don't tolerate that anymore. That the, the just the talking, you don't tolerate that anymore. I think that's the one eighty yeah. in a sense. Yeah, yeah, and I think the age we live in, where information is easier to find, where alternative perspectives are easier to find. Um, it makes it harder for those who are acting either in a corrupt manner, in a competent manner, maybe without a moral compass. Um, they, it's easier to find them and detect them maybe than it's ever been. Um, yeah. you know, we don't, we don't get our news from one of three news anchors, like in the United States, right? I mean, it, when I was a boy, you watched ABC, CBS, or NBC. There was a news anchor who did the news every night. And they largely said the same thing, by the way. And, you know, it's obvious now that they were kind of in cahoots with the politicians and the bankers and the leading business people. And, you know, there was a common narrative from them. And so you believed it. Like you believed yeah. um if if there was a given war going on, you, you believed that it was a a war for the right purpose. If there was a new tax being implemented, well, you went along with it because all these, you know, these three uh people who you you have been conditioned to trust all said the same thing. And, and, and the people around you watch the same thing, and they then also do the same thing, right? So there is right, no, that is, uh, yeah, yeah. And there's the, no yeah, contrarian right. view, right? Right. And the yeah. Mo yeah, and the moment that you found somebody that broke out from that, they stuck out like a sore thumb, mm. you know. Um, yeah. You know, and so, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that's what's changing. And I mean, that's a positive thing, right? That's all changing. It's harder, I think, for those things to exist. Um, it's harder for people to, to hide wealth. Uh, there's still a lot going on. But when you look at, you know, for instance, the wealth that Nancy Pelosi or Elizabeth Warren has acquired as a senator making, say, $170,000 a year, but somehow... After yeah, 60 being, million or something. Yeah. yeah, hundreds of millions, I think, in Pelosi's yeah. case. Mm -hmm. But go, well, how, 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 how exactly did that happen? Yeah. And, and um, you know, there's probably nothing you can do to reverse the wealth that she acquired. But I think it, it, you know, it, 30 years ago, no one would have even known that would have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. No one would have yeah. known. So talking about the past, I, I saved a tweet from yours um, where you talked about the Triffin dilemma, and I wanted to ask you a question about it. And yesterday, I actually had, had a conversation with someone, and we found it so interesting that, you know, sometimes people joke, right? Like, oh, a bread used to be 20 cents, and now it's $4 or 4 euros, right? And we yeah. talked about the fact that it's just so weird that people find that a joke. It must be actually an ultra signal for you, right? Like if, if, because I can get, this is what I try nowadays, right? Like I can get most people to agree that the progression of technology should make things cheaper. Yeah. And then I tell the joke about the bread and then I say, you know, does this make sense? Uh, you know, does, does the, the thing about the bread make more sense that fact or, you know, that everything should become cheaper and everyone agrees that, you know, true technology stuff should become cheaper right i think um, you know in general that's also what what jeff booth talks about a lot sure um but you had a tweet about uh, a tweet I'll, I'll i'll read it it said in 1954 factory workers single income could provide for a family they could own a home and they could own a car and as an answer to on x you know to what happened there you talked about the triffin dilemma which dictates that the country whose currency acts as a global re uh, reserve, must be a net importer of goods and a net exporter of currency. Why? Why isn't this possible anymore? Like, can you explain this this dilemma? Yeah. So, if we'll, we'll kind of look at it historically, so the U.S. became the global reserve currency not overnight, um, but I, I would say it culminated with the end of World War II. Um, 
but there was a transition kind of between World War One and World War Two from the British pound to the U.S. dollar. Well, at first, what must happen is if, for instance, a a uh, a company in Peru wants a new uh, highway to be built, yeah, and they want to hire, let's say, a German firm to manage that project and 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 build the highway, and it's going to cost five billion dollars. Well, the Germans don't want Peruvian pesos. Um, you yeah. know, they they want dollars, right? That contract is going to be in dollars. So what does that mean? That means Peru, if they want this highway built, has to come up with $5 billion. Well, the only way for them in reality to get $5 billion worth of goods or $5 billion is to sell $5 billion worth of goods to the, to the United States and yeah. get paid in in dollars. Well, so um I'm just going to make this up. You know, let's say in Peru there's only a finite number of things they could sell to the US that are worth 5 billion dollars. And now I'm pretty sure in Peru they grow potatoes really well. So um I could see the, the president of Peru goes to his uh, finance minister and maybe his um, uh, agricultural guys and he says, go to the U.S. and cut a deal so they'll buy $5 billion worth of potatoes. And so they show up and they go say, well, who can buy $5 billion worth of potatoes? Well, maybe only Walmart and a few big grocery store chains. So they go there and say, hey, uh, would you guys like to buy some potatoes? And they say, well, no, thank you. We we get a lot of potatoes from Idaho and Wisconsin and places like that, and they're good potatoes. We don't need your potatoes. Yeah. So um, they go back to Peru and tell the president, hey, um, they don't want to buy our potatoes. And he said, well, we can't build the highway. If we don't build the highway, we don't get reelected. So go back there and sell them some potatoes. Whatever the price needs to be, you sell them the potatoes, right? Yeah. So they get back and they go knock on the door and say, well, uh, what will it take for you to buy $5 billion worth of potatoes? And, you know, they have contracts and loyalties to these people in Idaho and the U.S. But eventually they say, well, if you'll undercut them by 15%, We'll buy the potatoes. So even though that may be under the cost of production in Peru, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter because yeah. there's only one way that highway is getting built. And so, so that's the leverage or the power of the dollar, right? As a reserve yeah. currency. Yeah. Okay. And what happens? The farmers in Wisconsin and Idaho, they get screwed. And what they mm -hmm. do is, by the way, they'll scream and say, Oh my God, the Peruvians, the evil Peruvians are undercutting us. They're selling below their cost. And aren't they terrible? And by the way, you can replace the Peruvian potatoes with Chinese uh, computers or cars or Japanese yeah. TVs or it doesn't matter, right? All these countries have to do the same thing. So this phenomenon, the Triffin Dilemma, says that it's wonderful. Because at first, what's happening, the U.S. is seeing this deflationary force, right? Because suddenly the purchasing power of the dollars is really strong, right? They're buying all these goods. But in, this, in parallel, what's happening is the, the production base, the manufacturing base, the agric agricultural base are being eroded. And you don't yeah. feel it at first. So in the case of the U.S., and the 1940s and the 50s and the 60s. It's not an overnight phenomenon, but this is happening. Um, Robert Triffin, who's the senator who you know, testified before Congress in 1960, he had the foresight to say, hey, guys, this is starting to happen. You know, he saw 15 years in what was going on. And so you know, part of my tweet was to say there's a fallacy 
because we'll see politicians in the U.S. I'm sure you see it in all these countries around the world. Like, hey, we will we will do X. Like in the U.S., it's often we will return um, American automobile manufacturing or the American textile yeah. industry or, you know, you pick it. There's nothing they can do. They could do very short term things through subsidies to falsely kind of create those uh, either subsidies or tariffs. But the reality is, either in the current system, either they will give up the reserve currency status, at which point these things can start to come back, because now the U.S. has to do the exact opposite thing. They have to produce goods and services, that yeah. whoever the new country is. But there is an out, and the out is you don't let any country have reserve currency status. You, you, you have it. A Bitcoin, right? Uh, Bitcoin, a rule without rulers. Monetary policy doesn't change. Nobody's in control. It's not. There have been proposals through the IMF and some other places about using baskets of currencies or baskets of commodities. Yeah. But if you think about it, you end up in the same problem. It ends up the exact same problem exists. Um, so this is the only way out, you know. And and uh, um, you know the the the. The problem is, like for the U.S., the reality is the the U.S. is addicted to the power that has come from being the world reserve currency. Because not only um, is the purchasing power of the dollar hard, but but now they control. It's a weapon, right? It's it's yeah. it, it's a means of control and surveillance and and did that so. Did that accelerate then after re getting off the gold standard and then getting into the petrodollar? Because then if we go of back course. to energy, you know, that's a fascinating, that's the best hack ever, right? You yes. buy real energy or real energy gets traded with a money that doesn't cost any energy to make, right? Like that's the ultimate, the ultimate wealth hack. Um, Absolutely. And, and, and that must fuel the addiction of trying to stay the world reserve currency, right? right because the, right. Yeah, or else you have to go back as to what you said. You have to motivate everyone well, again to go farm or build factories yeah. or you know whatever yeah. is lost well, in in the in the years in in America. Yeah. Well, it, it's my opinion. You no, know, we're at we're on the downside of the cycle. We can argue whether we're at five years or ten years or thirty mm -hmm. years from the end of the cycle of the dollar, but we're on the downhill slope and the. The only way out is painful, right? It's yeah. either become subservient to another country's currency or BRICS or something like that. I don't see that happening. Or go to Bitcoin. Now, the only hope that the U.S. has... Admit you is, lose. You lost, actually, again, the you, same yeah. thing. It's the same right. thing. Yeah. Pretty hard for a politician to do that, though, right? <laughs> yes. Pretty yeah. unlikely. So, yeah. you know, the, the only way out, but they won't do it, is to stack the shit out of Bitcoin, like to to yeah. for the U.S. to build a massive treasury of Bitcoin and then back the dollar. It could be with Bitcoin and and yeah. gold and some other things, but um, that chance is pretty close to pass too. Like there's just not enough left. The short side side thought there, like would that would that be like a digital, I want to say digital arms race, but like it's like a digital money race or something. Because if one country does this, what you just said, a big relevant country, then that race is on, right? Like you have to, oh, yeah. you have to adopt it, right? So could that also be, um, I don't want to say strategy, but like you have to be ready for that in a sense. Uh, and, and, I think that's the funny part. It's probably going to be too late, right? Like you're going to realize yeah. at 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 a point where it's way too late on the on 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 where you are on this downslope, as you said, yeah. which is probably also accelerating. That's a different yeah. conversation, I think. But like, yeah, there's going to be there's going to be a point where you are actually too late, uh, which would be very bad, obviously, for the people in America, but. It would prove the entire philosophy of Bitcoin in a sense, right? Exactly yeah. what we talked about in the beginning: the fact right. that you have to challenge yourself and get a, get um, 
get beyond this sunk cost fallacy or the disappointment in yourself or yes. your ego or whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. whatever you come across. It's right. that because only then you can, um, yeah, uh, get value from, from this new thing. You cannot play it, right? If you right. try to play it, you play yourself, I think. Yeah. And so at the sovereign nation level, it may be too late, but it's not too late at a personal level. That's the good news. So even yeah. if you live in a if you live in the U.S. or you live in Europe, um, Australia, a place like that, which are all basically dollar based, right? They're all living off of that yeah. system. Yeah. Um, you can still protect yourself. Yeah. And, and you know, but why is it so hard for people to understand this? What do you think? Is that just being oblivious yeah, because i mean i was yeah. the same before but yeah i think it's just being like you said oblivious and um you know the lindy effect which is kind of i think they're putting a lot of faith in the lindy effect which you know the lindy effect just basically says every day that something survives the likelihood that it fails um yeah, uh, gets lower gets lower yeah. and that's true for bitcoin but i think they they are applying that same thing to the fiat dollar too, and so they just don't believe it's going to fail. Hmm. I never heard that. That's. I think that's a good point. Although although it does go against all the rationale, right? Like I see people. Well, you know these videos where people say like I have three jobs and I don't have money for groceries and and I have no clue right. what is going on, you know, and a hundred thousand dollar marketing degree and I'm not working in marketing <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. So right. yeah, people need more. Unfortunately, I would say like you need a problem b before you realize. Um, what has yeah. been going on right? right yeah yeah all right um last question why well, 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 i have two questions left uh i i sent you this this quote and i saw you on the on the bitcoin matrix podcast and you said bitcoin is a chance to be part of something that will have more of a lasting impact on the world than anything else you can possibly be involved in when did you decide to go all in and dedicate your life on Bitcoin uh, to Bitcoin? I, I think we talked about this, but yeah. why is the concept of Bitcoin so big? Why is it a life's work? Um, well, as I, as I said earlier, money, a broken money system is the biggest problem I think the world faces. Um, as, a, as a boomer, I care about the world for my kids and my grandkids now more than I care about it for me. And I think that's the biggest gift I can give them. And I'd say the, that crystallized probably around 2019, 2020. That time mm. Yeah. yeah. That All right. Last question. And I ask everyone okay. the same question. What's a core belief that you will never let go? Uh, you know, Honesty, uh, transparency. I mean, that, that one of the things you learn as you get older is that um, you just have to be forthright and honest at all times. And, and uh, as painful as it may be, the effect of not doing so always is greater. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, I love this conversation. Thanks again for your time. I will link to your X profile. I will link to Barefoot Mining so people can check that out as well. And uh, yeah, I hope we can do this again sometime in the future. Thanks so oh, much. Great. Thanks for having me, Brown. Pleasure. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.